Hi, everyone. Uh, today, we are very happy to have Marco uh, giving us a virtual talk from uh, Singapore. Uh, it's very kind of him to agree to give a talk very late at night. He's going to talk about quantum many divergences and beyond. Um, please. OK, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for uh, inviting me and, and uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk to a completely different audience than um, whom I usually talk to. Um, um, so I'm barely a physicist. Um, I come from engineering originally and moved to physics during, during my PhD, but certainly had never been exposed to, to high energy theory. So I'm kind of fascinated by the fact that, that these tools that we introduced for information theory are, are used um, so widely. So, um, so what I plan to talk about today is essentially in two parts. Um, it's a bit of an overview talk, um, but in the first part, I want to um, discuss just generally Rennie divergence and related information measures and kind of how they come maybe from, from perspective, from a classical perspective, uh, uh, they're all well defined. And then when, when you go to quantum, there are issues that, that arise because of the non commutativity. So, um, so I want to discuss this a little bit. Um, and then in the second part, which um, we'll see how, how far we, we get there, this is mostly about applications of, of Rennie divergences and, and more kind of in the information uh, theoretic regime. So in particular for, for hypothesis testing, quantum hypothesis testing. And there we can kind of find operational meanings for all of these um, rainy divergences, or at least for some of them. Um, so we'll, we'll go a bit in, into that. Um, and uh, I'm happy to, to answer questions at, at any time. So please feel, to, feel free to, to interrupt me. Um, and as I said before, I'm also interested in, in learning more about um, how you use Rennie diversities. OK, so the first part um, is a bit of a, an attempt to, to make sense of all these possible definitions that are, that are used. Um, so, so I call it the guided tour through the entropy zoo. The, the entropy zoo is actually much bigger than just Rennie diverses. So, so people have come up with all kinds of different um, measures of information or quantum information. Um, but, but we'll focus on, on Rennie diversities. Um, so I'll start with, with something very basic classical. Um, and that is the, the notion that the Shannon originally introduced, which is the, the notion of the surprisal. So the idea is that quantifying information is, is conceptually not, not so trivial uh, to, to get a mathematical handle on it. Um, but what we can do is we can interpret it as a, a lack of surprise about the outcome of a random experiment. So this is called the surprisal um, or the, the lack of surprise. No. Um, we will, we'll see what, what that means. Um, so if you have a random variable taking values from a given set um, and the probability distribution on it, then the surprisal is just another random variable that is defined as log of one over p of, of x. So you see, if, if, if some event x has small probability, then uh, the surprisal will be uh, large. And uh, if, if an event appears with probability one deterministic event, then, then you would have no surprisal at all, right? Um, so this is the the original notion, and, and from that, um, Rennie defined entropy as the, uh, sorry, Shannon defined entropy as the expectation value of this surprisal. And um, that is um, in, in many tasks in, in, in uh, classical information theory, this is exactly what we need. In other tasks, like in cryptography, we are often interested in the minimal surprisal instead, which is, is just the minimum over over x of, of s of x instead of the, the expectation. 
Um, more generally, we can actually look at the full distribution of this surprisal and can characterize it by, uh, for example, by the cumulant generating function of the surprisal. And so the cumulant generating function of the surprisal, that is, is directly related to um, the Rennie entropy. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so that's how we, we classically can kind of come up with this family of, of entropies. Um, and we can do similar things for, for relative entropy. Here we look instead at the, the log likelihood ratio as a random variable, and then take its expectation um, uh, to get the, the relative entropy. And again, we can also look at the cumulant generating function of the log likelihood ratio to get classical uh, Rennie divergences. Now I've written down this everything for, for finite sets, X. Uh, obviously, this can be generalized to um, general probability measures. Um, OK, so that's classically. Um, now, the final thing I want to say um, about classical um, entropies is that we can see the, the relative entropy as kind of a, a parent quantity to all kinds of information measures that we're interested in. So for example, the entropy can be written uh, in terms of the, the, the relative entropy of Px with a uniform distribution, so this ux. Um, and I mean, this looks a little bit arbitrary at first, um, but it turns out that this is a very useful way of defining um, these measures because it works also um, for, for all kinds of Rennie divergences. So if we define these quantities um, by just replacing D with D alpha, then we get useful measures of Rennie entropy, Rennie conditional entropy, Rennie mutual information, and even Rennie uh, conditional mutual information. Um, and the reason we want to do it this way is essentially because um, all the properties that, that we expect from entropy, conditional entropy, mutual information, and so on, um, they can then be derived from properties of the relative entropy itself. And so this can be done for, for any divergences as well. Um, the point being that, that for example, uh, an example of such a property would be that a conditional entropy should be monotone when we apply um, a classical channel or a quantum channel on the side information. So if we have this uh, age of x given y, if, if we apply a channel on y, then we expect this entropy to uh, increase or, or to be non-decreasing, um, to be more precise. Um, because somehow by acting on the side information, we cannot gain more information about x, right? So there are lots of intuitive properties that we assign to these measures of, of correlation or information. And if we define them in terms of relative entropies, then all of these properties follow from a single property, which is the data processing inequality of, of the relative entropy or the monotonicity of the relative entropy on the channels. Can I can ask you a quick question. Someone sure. on a high level. So you when, when you were talking about the derivation of Shannon entropy, you mentioned the fact that our desire that we want to add uh, the measures of information when the processes are independent, right? So that's why there's a log, one log of one over p, right? So um, the moment you talk about other measures like the one-shot measures, like the one that you had the max. Right. So you're no longer talking about this additivity thing. Right. So is, is uh, no, no, no. So um, all the Rennie entropies are additive under tensor products. Uh, that is still true. Um, but the maximum, the maximum over uh, the multiplication of two sets is not going to be the maximum of this times the maximum of that. Right. 
Uh, am I, am I, no, no, maybe I'm, no, no, of course it is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So all these values. Um, yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So in fact, um, so classically, one can show that these, um, the Rennie divergences here, they actually are complete in the sense that these are the only measures that satisfy both data processing um, and are additive for, for if you take tensor products on, on both uh, for both uh, distributions. So for two measures, classically, you're saying that these are the only things that satisfy additivity plus data processing. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Um, classically, this is true. Um, in quantum, we, we don't have a full characterization of, um, of all the measures that satisfy data processing and additivity. But yeah. Um, okay, good. So, so this was kind of justification of, of why um, we are mostly interested in the, in the first place, we're interested in the relative entropies. And then we can kind of define everything from there. And it turns out that this viewpoint works even better in, in quantum um, because in quantum, it's not so clear um, how otherwise we would define all of these, these quantities. Um, and so, so it helps us that if we, if we understand divergences, then, then we can kind of um, define everything else from that. Okay. <clears throat> Oh, okay, and then there's a final one on, on kind of um, uh, motivation. Um, so the question obviously is why are these the right definitions that we've chosen? Um, and there are two approaches to it. One of them is saying, well, they have nice mathematical properties, um, which makes them in particular useful in, in proofs and uh, and so on. So. So the, the state of processing inequalities mostly, or the, the, the relative entropy is positive definite, and so on. Um, but another way of looking at it is, is via the operational meaning, for example, that the entropy is the minimum amount of memory per symbol needed to store a, a memoryless source distributed with, with Px um, losslessly. Okay, so so it, so we can have well-defined um, uh, information theoretic problems where these measures then just pop out as as a, as the a solutions to the the problem. Um, so that's what I mean by operational meaning, and we will get back to that in in the second part of the of the talk. Now, one remark is that these two things are obviously tightly connected. Um, Right, the nice mathematical properties are needed to prove operational meaning. Um, and sometimes you can also use the operational meaning itself to derive mathematical properties. Um, obviously, it's always nice to have a direct um, uh, proof, but often cer certain things just follow from, from operational considerations. So, so here I, I put the example in the in the footnote that the joint entropy has to smaller be smaller or equal to the, the sum of its parts. Um, that essentially one can derive that inequality just by by staring closely at the interpretation of this this compression problem. Um, it is easier to compress jointly x and y than to do it separately. Right? Because if you jointly compress, you can use correlations between x and y um, to compress it further. For example, x could be equal to y, and then obviously you, you only need to compress it once. Um, so that, that's how you, you kind of um, can argue in, in both directions. Sorry, quick uh, question. Uh, maybe uh, you'll comment on this, but. Uh, our is there, is there, so we're, we're, you're probably going to mention the uh, hypothesis testing, but is there some sort of a way, is there a way to understand hypothesis testing as some related to some sort of compression as well, or in general, full generality? So we are familiar with compression for, 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 for one-name entropy. 
or Shannon entropy, but for other measures, is there compression in interpretation? Um, no, well, I wouldn't say that there's a compression, directly compression interpretation of, of relative entries, although, although I'm sure that also exists. Um, um, but yeah, I, would, I wouldn't know right now. Um, so this, there's no I've done all kinds no. of, 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 of operation it means, but hypothesis testing is kind of a in in a way a very fundamental task, and one can relate many of uh, other information theoretic problems like channel coding, for example, to hypothesis testing. For sure, thank you. Uh, and and that's in in a, in some sense that's how because all these problems are are related in a very fundamental like one shot way. Um, that's why kind of the same quantities appear in all of these problems. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, but but hypothesis testing is is nice because it's it's very easy to to define what, um, the task, and, and it's it's very natural also in, in quantum. So that's why it's kind of the the most direct application of of these. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I have a basic question. Sure. Um, uh, could, could you tell me the definition of amount of what, what the amount of memory is? Um, what do you mean by the well, memory? Uh, well, it, it, uh, by that I mean the number of bits per symbol that you need. Ah, ah okay, okay. Just that. Okay, okay. I see. Thank yeah. You. Um, but it's kind of in a in a in an asymptotic limit. Mm -hmm. Right. So right, you take right, right. many instances of the, the source and then and then encode them. And mm -hmm. the question is how many bits do you need per symbol? Right, right. Okay, okay. I see, I see. Thank you. Um okay. Now this slide you probably don't need. Um this is just um how we go now from from classical to quantum, um, but but that part you're you're very familiar with, so I'm I'm going to skip. Um, but the point is is kind of that when we go from from classical to quantum, there are now many different expressions um, that a, a, a quantum divergence could take. So so we just look at the regular relative entropy, um, then. Right, because of the non competitivity there are different ways of ordering um, operators here. And like on first side, it's not clear which orderings are meaningful and, and which ones are not. Um, it turns out that this these two quantities that are highlighted are 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 in some sense useful. So the the top one is the Umegaki uh, definition of, of quantum relative entropy. And and that one that we will see has lots of operational interpretations in, for example, in hypothesis testing where it appears in quantum Stein's lemma. Um, but the one with the with the hat also um, is nice in the sense that it, it also satisfies uh, data processing on the on the CPTP maps. Um, and so mathematically, it's it's maybe equally uh, useful. Than uh, the relative entropy, the Umegaki relative entropy, um, and if we just swap the order of the the rho and sigma in the logarithm, then we get this this third quantity, which it turns out does not satisfy data processing, and and so that one certainly is operationally um, meaningless um, because one thing we we, we know um, is that. Um, it has to satisfy data processing code to be operationally meaningful. Uh, because for example, in hypothesis testing, uh, it's clear that if you apply a, a channel on both states, that makes the, um, makes the problem more difficult. So the problem of distinguishing two states, right? If you apply a channel to both of them, um, you, you, you get noisier versions. And so it's more difficult to distinguish them. Um, and and so all whenever uh, like a quantity appears in in hypothesis testing, uh, it, it must satisfy data processing so that we 
because this monotonicity is kind of inherent in the in the problem. Um, so we can, in in, the, in that sense, we can we can uh, exclude this uh, this third quantity. Um, but the, the other two satisfy data processing, so so we're kind of uh, stuck. They're also both additive. Um, so yeah, so so what? Um, okay, so I talked about the data processing before, but here is kind of formally stated what it what it means. Um, um, so it's this monotonicity on the channel. So here is the, is, is again the, the, the classical version. And uh, one thing that I, I mentioned before, um, and maybe here's an explicit example, is that this property actually implies all kinds of other properties that that we wish. So for example, we we expect that the entropy itself uh, should increase under mixing operations. So mixing operations in, in quantum, uh, then there will be unital channels. So we expect that if you apply a unital channel to the, the argument of the, the entropy, then um, the entropy should be uh, non-decreasing. Non okay, and we, we, can, we can see this because um, If you use this definition of, of um, the Rennie that works in terms of, of, of D alpha, then we just use um, data processing for D alpha, which um, uh, for a bistochastic map. So a bistochastic map is it keeps the uniform distribution, uh, maps it to itself. I mean, in the quantum case, uh, we would have an identity X there. And the unital channel would map that to itself. So then the data processing directly implies the, the kind of the inequality that we want. This is just an example of, of why I said that um, well, that um, uh, understanding divergence is kind of the, the main or first objective. So okay, so how do we do this now? So we have um, Kind of for each alpha, we have a unique classical quantity, and uh, now we are interested in, in finding quantum general uh, quantum generalizations of this. So there is there is kind of a, a principled way in which we can do this, and how we can define minimal and maximal extensions of of any divergence. So one of them on on the top um, is the so called um, measured of any divergence, which I here call minimal, um, a minimal extension. Um, and it's just defined by taking supremum over all measurements and then looking at the classical Rennie divergence of the, the measurement outcomes. Okay, so, so we, we, we try to find the measurement that kind of least disturbs the two states so that the, the entropy doesn't um, um, decrease too much. Um, and so this definition, um, it, it's easy to see that it, that it satisfies data processing because essentially you can just incorporate the, the data processing into the measurement. And then because of the supremum, it, it, it will, um, you, you get the, the data processing inequality. Um, um, it's not additive though. So, so this, uh, is a, an extension that at the moment we are only looking at preserving uh, data processing. Now, the second way we can do this is by looking at preparations. So here we just look at um, distributions P and Q and preparation channels that um, when, when the preparation channel is applied to P, it will produce rho, and if it is applied to Q, it produces sigma. And so we define um, this, this hat um, entropy as the infimum over all such preparations. And so by construction, this will also satisfy a data processing. 
Um, what is it? Not very difficult to show, um, but but still not not immediately visible is that any quantum generalization that satisfies the data processing inequality actually has to lie between these two. So between the minimal and the maximal, and I mean that's why they're they're called that. Essentially, this is because right if if a quantity satisfies data processing, then in particular, measuring is a, is a, is data processing, and, and preparation is also data processing. So um, yeah, so that forces it to be to lie in between um, these two quantities. So now the hope would be that these two expressions are actually the same, right? If if they were, um, then kind of the everything would collapse, and we would get a single meaningful quantum extension. Um, but um, this um, turns out not to be uh, true. So first of all, for certain parameter ranges, we, we can find closed form expressions for these um, quantities. So in particular, this d hat, um, this maximal one, we can express it. Uh, it has this, this particular form. Uh, which is interesting because uh, this is a, a mean um, um, so this 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 term here we can express it as a as a mean now I'm just wondering I think it's like the, the, this this alpha means uh, so I think this this whole trace is just a trace of of the mean. Um, I think I think that is correct. This way, yeah, yeah, because I can take the sigma on the on the other side of it, and then I get the definition of these these operator means that uh, have been studied by by Ando, for example. Um, so that that, that is kind of a. a, a so Sorry, basic question. I think you mentioned the point that I didn't quite understand. So, can you make the statement again? Uh, what is the statement about what quantities have to lie between the min and max thing, this maximal and minimal extensions? What are the conditions uh, for this theorem? That oh, any quantum generalization of d alpha. So, which means that what? any 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 measure we write down that satisfies data processing, which reduces to the classical answer in the case that they're commuting, has to be. Oh wow, that's an interesting theorem. Okay. Yes, yes, that is exactly um, the the correct okay. theorem. Yes. Um, yeah. But it's. I mean, the theorem is actually quite easy to to see um, from just from these definitions. Um, and and the, the only thing you you take advantage of is that preparation and measurement itself are are channels. Is this some sort of statement within the in the sense of like uh, non commutative generalizations of uh, LP norms and stuff? Is this some sort of a statement about LP spaces, non commuting LP spaces? Sounds like it, right? I mean. I, in 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 a way, I think, I mean, the method that we 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 uh, apply here to 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 get this is is quite general. So, um, it might be possible to to define a maximal and a minimal generalization of of LP norms. Okay. Um, yeah. in, in in such a way as well. Like. The reason the I question say is kind of what kind of property you want to preserve, right? Um, yeah, the reason I say this is that the non commutative definition of these LP norms, the non commuting LP norm spaces, they often, the definition of the norm involves infant soup. Like that's just how they come. There's no sharp way of writing them down. Um, yes. Yeah, anyway, so it's just, it's just a thought. Thank you. So, so here in general, it's also not. Um, um, possible to find a, a closed form, uh, in particular for the measured one, um, that the, 
the best form we have for that is, is a, an optimization problem. One can simplify a, a bit because here, I mean, here I'm not very specific. I just say supremum over all measurements. Um, but it, it's really, it means here uh, over all uh, arbitrary POVM measurements. And then one can, one can show that actually one only needs rank one projective measurements and, and can rewrite the optimization a little bit. Um, but yeah, you don't get rid of it. It's kind of nice that in for this D hat quantity, we do have a closed form, at least in some range of, of parameters. Um, one, one more question that, um, sorry, I keep asking these questions because these are old questions that I never really found answers to. Um, and going from relative entropy, generalizing <clears throat> from relative entropy to other measures, something crucial happens in my mind. The relative entropy is uh, monotonic under any positive map, right? Not just CP. Whereas these Rennie generalizations are going to be just restricted, the, the uh, monotonicity is going to be restricted to CP maps, right? Um, so I, I um, isn't that correct? Uh, I'm just trying to remember. Um... I thought at least the sandwich ones are, are also monotone on the positive. Oh, is that true? Uh, okay. Maps. Okay, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Then. Okay. Um, but I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure now. They're certainly monotone on the ten so-called tensor positive maps. So maps that if you if you tensor them with themselves, um, remain positive. I see, I see. Thank you. On, on the that, they're certainly um, monotone. Now, I'm not 100% sure. I think they're monotone on the, on the just positive maps. But I, I would need to check that. No. So it, 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 I, I think, I, I mean, I'll let you know. Um, I know where the, the, the proof is if it exists. Um, I'm just not 100% sure at the moment. Um, okay, so yeah, so these quantities, um, they have this, this um, belovkin sasevsky divergence as a limit, as alpha goes to one, which is one of the, the generalizations of, of, of the relative entropy uh, that I proposed at the beginning. Um, so that one is, is, is nicely behaved. And I think it might even be older than the, the umegaki. So people looked at this one before they, they looked at umegaki. Um, okay. So th that was the, the maximal extension. Now the minimal extension. Oh, and uh, uh, one thing to notice here is also that this closed form turns out to be additive, right? Um, so that's also nice. Uh, we didn't actually enforce additive activity by our construction, but it turns out to be additive. Um, now the sandwiched one is is not additive, um, but what we can do as kind of a, a general um, approach is to to look at its regularization. Um, so the regularization is, is just this term here where we take n copies of the state and, and renormalize it by, by uh, 1 over n. And now obviously if the quantity is additive, then this does nothing. Um, if it's not additive, then uh, by the definition of our, our uh, uh, of this quantity, right, it has a supremum over measurements. So um, the, this limit is actually always larger or equal to the alpha itself, because on 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 kind of the, the end copies we can now do joint measurements. So so we have more measurements at our disposal. So that's how we get um, the inequality. And now it turns out that this regularized quantity that that has a closed form, and and that's the sandwiched. Um, Divergence. Oh. So that one you you know. Um, 
And so one way to, to see it is as the, this limit of, of the minimal or measured um, Rennie divergence, this regularized limit. Um, now, what this does is kind of um, um, in, 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 a, in a way is that we're still minimal now, but amongst those Rennie divergences that satisfy both the DPI and are also additive. So, right, you see that the, the, the resulting expression that we get is now additive. Um, and it still satisfies DPI. And in, in fact, um, it satisfies DPI for, for channels that are, um, well, it, this kind of expression proves, um, right? Because the, the measured relative entropy satisfies DPI on the, on the actually um, just positive channels. And that, that follows by, by construction. And so this D, uh, this regularized one satisfies the DPI under all channels that are tensor positive. Um, that also just follows from the definition. Um, and so, so what we found is with this, this sandwich Rennie divergence, we have the smallest generalization of the classical quantity that says as DPI and is additive. And, and yeah, it has found various um, operational interpretations because, because of this, um, uh, this property. Um, and we'll, we'll see a little bit if we, if we have time. Um, okay, okay, so. Sorry, sorry, sorry for the I think I checked, you're absolutely right. Uh, the Rennies are all monotonic and they're all positive, but the difference between relative entropy and Rennie comes into trace non-increasing linear maps is the thing that Rennies are all monotonic under, but for relative entropy, it has to be trace preserving linear maps that are positive. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think, I, I, yeah, that, that's what it was. Sorry about that. Yes, with trace increasing and uh, so the trace non-increasing maps, one, one has to be very careful with how one defines things. Normalization, right? Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Um, so, so usually, see if sigma is not normalized, that's not a problem. But if rho is not normalized, um, there are different ways in which one can define them. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, so usually, I wouldn't define it like like it's written here. For if rho is not guaranteed to be traceless. But like under the log, I would have this, this sandwich trace and then divided by trace of rho or something like this. That's right. Um, and I don't know if one takes the right definition, if one cannot also show monotonicity on the, uh, for trace non-increasing maps. But this I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I think if appropriately defined, I think one can one can fix this. Um, so, so can I ask another question? So sure. are you saying that the minimal uh, the minimal extension is this set of words the thing that you would use as an information theorist? Would you say that the minimal extension of um, minimal extension quantity is some sort of a one shot measure or one shot version of the Sandwich divergences, would you say that? Um, so with, with the minimal one, you mean that the, the measured? Yeah the, yeah, the very fact that the, the second part of their equals, right? That, that when you have infinite number of copies available, right? For rho and sigma, you're saying that the minimal extension becomes a sandwich ready. Yes, so, so this, yeah, in, I mean, in a way you can, so is it the, the measure to be the one shot, and then if you regularize it, you get the sandwiched. And yeah, regularizing is kind of yeah, taking an asymptotic limit. Um, so the minimal. Yeah, I mean you can you can think of of, the, of it this way. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, 
Um, yeah, here just some remarks on how one actually shows this. Um, I mean, it's not it's not complete. Um, um, but we know uh, one direction is relatively easy um, because this d alpha tilde or so the sandwiched, we know it to be additive. So we can do this, this regularization for free. And then we also know that the sandwich is larger be, than um, the measured because it satisfies data processing, right? So we have this, this direction we, 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 we get. Um, I mean, when I say we know that, it's, I'm kind of assuming that we know um, that the sandwiched expression satisfies data processing, um, which we don't know. I mean, that one has to show, right? Um, so once we know that this limit is, is uh, you can do it both ways, right? Before I argued that because we know that this limit uh, is the sandwich, from that follows that sandwich satisfies data processing. Um, but actually in order to show this limit, you, you already use that it satisfies data processing. So you still, you don't, at some point you need to show data processing for the, the specific expression for the sandwich. Um, uh, so you don't, you don't get that um, for free. Now, the other direction is kind of to show that um, this limit is larger or equal to, to the sandwich. Um, that essentially uses a, a pinching uh, trick, which is, is, is very common in, in, uh, for these kind of problems. Um, the, it, it, it's a very nice trick, but it's also very finite dimensional. And uh, we haven't been able to make this argument here uh, work in, in infinite dimensions. Um, well, at least not for general, uh, for Neumann algebra. Under some conditions, uh, we, can do, we can do it. But the point is that you essentially, um, you do this pinching operation, which is, is just data processing. Um, and this pinching operation is, is such that, that it makes rho tensor n and sigma tensor n commute. And so you, you project onto the, the eigenspaces of sigma tensor n and, and, and throw away all the off diagonals. So, so you make rho tensor n block diagonal in, in blocks that, that, uh, where that the different eigenvalues of sigma live. So that makes them commute. Um, and the point is that we don't need too many of those projectors because um, sigma tensor n doesn't have too many different eigenvalues, only polynomially many. Um, and, and, and then we can show kind of that this operation doesn't disturb um, the Rennie divergence too much. Um, yeah, so, so it essentially follows from this, this pinching inequality here. So that, that one is extremely useful. But when I say polynomial in N, um, that hides the fact that the exponent of this polynomial is a dimension of the, of the single system. Uh, so, so this just doesn't work in, in infinite dimensions and, and, and yeah, it's kind of a, a uh, a problem uh, for, for some, some questions. Um, good, okay, so mm, that's that. Um, then as you know, probably that the, 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 there are many interesting special cases of the, the sandwich rate divergence. So in particular, the fidelity uh, you recover at one half um, at, at at one, you, you get the, the usual Omegaki relative entropy. Um, at infinity, uh, you get what is called the, the max relative entropy, which is essentially defined by this, this operator inequality. 
Um, and also for alpha equals two, is what it's called the collision divergence. Um, some of them are useful um, not only for their mathematical properties, but, but also because they're somewhat easier to compute um, depending on, on what kind of, um, um, in what kind of form you, you have the states, right? Um, so if, if we're gonna be, if it's matrix product states, then, uh, then um, the Umikaki relative phantom is actually very difficult to compute, but this D2 is, is somewhat more feasible. Sorry, a quick question about comment about a question about what your, your last comment. This has been mysterious to me actually. So uh, you're absolutely right, it's easier to calculate D2, but I'm not quite familiar with the physical interpretation or maybe information theoretic interpretations, collision divergence. I often see the name, but I don't really know what it represents. Um, this, what, what's the like interpretation? What kind of, what's the nicest way of thinking about this quantity? Um, hmm. So, so the name the name comes from from actually the entropy. So H two of X, uh, which I think is just uh, wait, what, it would just be I guess minus log. Maybe it's just this. So, so you put, put in sigma uh, yeah, yeah, I think that, okay, so that's the, the the entropy. Now this px squared sum of x px squared is the probability if you pick, so you have a distribution px, and then you pick x1 and x2 independently. Right? Then the probability that x1 equals to x2, that is just the, the sum of x of p x squared. Oh, I see. Right. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see. So that's the collision. Um, right. Okay. So that's for the for the classical quantity where I come from, and then I think for the quantum one, we just used the the <laughs> same name. Um, okay. Yeah. For for these extensions, I don't actually know for the for the relative entropy whether collision directly makes sense, but. I see. Thank you. Yeah, maybe maybe there is a nice interpretation, but I'm, I'm not aware of it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is the collision entropy. Okay, um, and then I kind of the final one that I need to mention, um, even though it doesn't really fit into uh, uh, these kind of. Uh, general families that that are kind of defined by minimum or maximum of, of all possible rain diversions. So these pets rain diversions are actually in between. Um, they are um, also useful, but well, first of all, they have a very simple form. So they, they, they've been around for much longer than the sandwiched ones, because that's kind of the, maybe the first thing you, you write up uh, when you see the, the classical definition and try to generalize, generalize it to quantum, you probably arrive at this. Um, and, and they're also useful, and in particular, they also have operational meaning in hypothesis testing. Um, but one property that they, they kind of have is that they, they only satisfy data processing between zero and two. Whereas the sandwiched, um, I didn't, mentioned this, but uh, D2 
this uh, whatever I've, I've done here only works for alpha between one half and infinity. Uh, for smaller than one half, I can still define this measured quantity, but the limit would be a different one. So it wouldn't it wouldn't limit to the the sandwich. Um, is there sorry? Is there is there a nice interpretation for um, sandwich Rennie's for alpha less than half? So I understand that it doesn't satisfy the process thing. But is there some sort of nice interpretation operation? Um, no, and, and, and I wouldn't expect one because they don't satisfy data process. Yeah, that, that's exactly the point that I was trying to make. Yeah. Any, any operational interpretation I always I think about. But I see. Yeah, it would be strange. Um, th there is a, a, it's called a reverse sandwiched ray divergence, which <laughs> looks like the ray divergence, but it has uh, like the central, but, but somehow the sandwiching is, is in the other way. Um, I, I wouldn't know how to write it down the expression right now, but the so that one is actually the turns out to be the minimal one. Like if you take this limit, you you just get a different quantity. Because we are we are more familiar with the one name and algebra form of these in terms of relative modular operator and such. And um, in the case of the standard sandwich training in the correct in the range where it's uh, satisfied data processing, it's just a norm. It's a particular uh, non-commutative norm, LP norm. But yeah. in the case of alpha being less than half, it becomes a semi-norm. And uh, it, it just, you, the expression still works. But of course, you don't get data processing. And we're just kind of wondering, maybe these are these have to do with properties of semi-norms. We have to, we're not familiar with them all that much. Yeah. I. I don't, I wouldn't expect anything I see. useful to, to come out of them somehow. Um, we, we, we dropped this question and you're suggesting that was right. <laughs> we did not chase them. Yes, but there is a, what I'm saying is there's this, this reverse sandwich thing, um, which um, does satisfy data processing. And uh, um, I don't know, you, you probably know this, this alpha C family of, of any divergences. Yes, yes. This two parameter family. Yeah. Yeah. All... So they are in they're in there in that family. Yeah, that fam that family is just like uh we, we understand them that these Kubo and domain type of expressions of relative modular operators. So they all fall in that category. So you're just calculating a P norm, non the P norm of some Kubo and domain of some relative modular operators. So all that family is in there. Um, I see. Yes. And uh, yeah, you, you can ask the same question, right? You can, um, what is the smallest one for alpha between zero and, and one half? Which is the smallest, uh, smallest quantity that still satisfies data processing and additivity? And, and I mean, there is a concrete answer to that. Um, but it's not the sandwich. Sorry, I didn't understand your last point. Uh, can you say it again? What's the smallest? Uh... So, right, I can. Um, um, what where is this now? Oh, you're you're you're. I, I mean, I. Uh, what I'm saying is, I can always do this. But in the range of alpha less than half. Yeah, you, I can also oh, oh, yeah. find okay. this limit in the in the for alpha smaller than. But I, I guess my question is that in the for the alpha smaller than half, even in the classical case, is there a nice interpretation? Let's just start classical. If there is nothing nice in their classical case, we shouldn't expect anything quantum. That would be. Oh no no no! I mean, in, in classically, um, we the, there is interpretation of 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 Rennie divergences for alpha smaller than one half. Oh, there is. Oh, I see. Yeah, and and also quantum in, in hypothesis testing, but it's going to be the pets. Uh, range divergence that that is used uh, there. I see. So now I, I'm just curious. Yeah. Okay. This is this is we, we don't have to talk about this. It's just some guess. I wonder if there are any of these quantities we can write down where they will satisfy monotonicity for all the um, 
uh, maps that are convex compositional unitaries, but not all CP maps. Or can we write down such quantities? Because those are the more natural analogs of classical channels, right? Any classical channel with a convex composition of um, permutations, right? Um, that's just a thought. I don't know if, it, this, if there are any quantities of that nature or. I mean, that, that would only give you bi-stochastic channels also classically, no? Um, yeah, but sorry, sorry, I should, well, yeah. So, but, so but in quantum, they would be unital. Correct, correct. No, I, I, I'm, I'm talking about bi-stochastic, indeed, correct. Um, but not all unital channels are convex composition of uh, unitaries, right? There are other channels. Yeah, yeah, so, so in qu quantum, it's a bit more complicated. Um, um, I mean, all right. Uh, I mean that characterization is is, is no longer correct, um, but uh, we actually for for relative vendors we, we expect them to be monotone on the on the general CPTP maps. So I wouldn't know what to do with one that's only monotone on or or bi stochastic or or unital maps C, unital CPTP yeah. maps. Um, but it's an interesting question. There might be more, yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we should probably let you go ahead because, like, <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, I probably won't get to the end, but that doesn't that doesn't matter. Um, okay, so we have pets. Um, then, um, yeah, this is just some something that that I need because I'm I'm often interested in in kind of higher order. Um, expansions of, of, of operational problems. And so one thing I need is the derivative of, of this d alphas at alpha equals one. And that is called this, this divergence variance. Uh, yeah, you can kind of classically, this would be the, the variance of the, of the log likelihood ratio. Um, and it also kind of shows the relationship between these two families because they, they are tang tangential at, at one. Uh, so that the pets and the, the sandwich. Um, good. So here is just like uh, to really. Uh, can not can I also say sure? sure. Um, so you said that these quantities are like monotonic in alpha. So is there any physical interpretation to that like monotonicity? Hmm. Just like data processing inequality has like has some physical significance. Yeah, I, I mean, it's difficult because I wouldn't say that the alphas are directly physical. Um, now, why are they? The monotonicity is, is kind of, it actually, the way it's usually proven is by, by showing that the, um, that without the prefactor, without the, the one over uh, alpha minus one, without that prefactor, then this function really classically corresponds to um, the cumulant generating function. And, and the cumulant generating function is, is convex in, in, in the parameter. Um, and that is actually what's used to, to get the monotonicity then. So maybe this, this convexity of the cumulant generating function and, and its quantum extension is maybe a, a bit more natural than monotonicity. Monotonicity just follows from the, the particular parametrization with this prefactor. Um, Sorry, are we understanding this correctly when you say this uh, generating functional that you're talking about? I have in mind some sort of a classical, simple uh, analogy in thermodynam with thermodynamics when relative entropy becomes a change in free energy, when your reference state sigma is like e to minus beta h, right? So you get something that looks like free energy where it's energy minus uh, bit, uh, TS, right? S is one moment entropy. So is this some sort of a 
you're, you're not talking about some sort of convexity or of free energy. Is that? No, that's not what you, you mean, right? You mean we're, we're talking about? No, I'm, I'm just talking about, I mean, maybe that what, what I was saying was not very helpful for uh, to answer the question, to be honest. Um, what, what I meant was simply that, uh, where did I write it? Oh, I didn't really write it down here, but you see this, I wrote this H alpha in terms of the cumulant generating function um, of this surprisal random variable. And, and similar, we can do that the same for D alpha classically. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, right. Sorry. And and this K function is convex in, in its parameter. Right, right. And I, I think that, uh, That that is relatively easy to see classically, but but uh, um, yeah, I don't know why that should be a natural property. To be honest, uh, why we want to preserve that for them. Like for example, you said that if if data processing inequality is not satisfied, then we should not care about the quantity. But that logic or that policy does not apply in this monotonicity in alpha. For example, if some quantity that satisfies data processing but does not is not monotonic in alpha, that is still like a nice quantity to study. Is that correct? Um yes. I mean, I'm also like for these alpha C families, right? If you let C vary with alpha, I think you construct it, can construct it also in such a way that it's it's not necessarily monotonic anymore. So if you, if you, if C is a function of alpha, um, but it turns out, yeah, at least the sandwich and the pets are, are monotonic. Um, and there might be reasons why we want this for, for particular families, but since they're multiple families, um, yeah, it's not, it's not so clear. Like if you if you think about the two dimensional space of, of alpha C entropies, right? You can probably find a line through that space uh, that so that the quantities are not monotonic. Um, but yeah, so I think that monotonicity is, is a, a necessary requirement in the same way that data processing is. Um, all right, all right. Thanks. Yes. Okay. So here I just wanted to to um, again give the example kind of how they are tangential here, the, the sandwich and the, the pets. So sandwich and pets. And then this D hat is somehow above and, and at two, they cross again the pets and the and the hat, and, and kind of the the non-solid lines uh, or ranges where data processing doesn't hold. Um, okay, so just really to see that 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 they are actually different for for some very simple states. Um, now. We can do the same kind of game that we've done uh, also for entropies. Um, if we do it for entropies and we find minimal and maximal extension, there actually turns out that they're the, the same. So if you want it to reduce to a, a classical Rennie entropy, there's a unique quantum generalization that satisfies um, monotonicity under, in, and here it's unical maps, right? For, for entropy, we want it to be non-decreasing onto unital maps. On the channels, they can do whatever they want, right? Because we, it could be a replacer channel. Um, so obviously entropy is not monotone on the, on the CPTP channels, but it is on the, on the um, unital. Um, and so, so here's a unique extension. Now conditional entropy, uh, again, um, is a bit complicated. And the reason is that 
we can actually define it in, in multiple ways. So we can define it as this in terms of the relative entropy. Now here, I didn't um, pull out this, this log um, dimension factor, but instead just use identity instead of the, the uniform distribution. So that makes it a little bit more compact. Um, but then in terms of there are two ways to, to define it. One way by just taking the marginal on the second distance, the other one by, by optimizing over it. And it turns out that these two things are actually equivalent um, for the, the, the regular relative entropy. So if it's the Umegaki relative entropy, then these two, these two things are equivalent. Um, and, uh, but we'll see for, for Rainy entropy, this is not the, uh, the same. Um, Okay, good question. This is this has been some uh, an issue that's uh, at least confused me for a very long time. So, if we if we were to generalize this to an arbitrary one by one algebra, <clears throat> let's say that the thing that we the problem that we the, the wall we hit is that there might not exist uh, in, in system A algebra A might not be tracial. There might not exist yes. system A, and. Uh, that's basically what has blocked us for a very, very long time. Are there quantities that are intimately tied to this conditional entropy that are well-defined in the absence of trace? Um, I, can, I can say actually what the physics of this is, but yeah, go ahead. Um, so yeah, usually what happens, e even classically for, for the, the case of, of continuous systems, um, is that that entropy is not not really well defined as a concept? Um, the relative entropy. In that case, well, what people look at is is this differential entropy, um, which is kind of almost the derivative of the the entropy in some in some strange way. Um, um, but. If you want to define these things for for uh, for normal algebras, I mean, I know there's there's some work um, where they assume that it's it's uh, type one, the, the first system, I think, uh, and then they could define it. Um, yeah, that sounds. I don't know. It's by, by Berta and and Schultz. Um, yeah, no, we're familiar with that paper, but I, I guess maybe maybe let me just say the physics context for this. So for an arbitrary one Neumann algebra, relative entropy is well-defined, but in particular, we're interested in quantum field theory, like us, people like us, we're very interested in quantum field theory. It's a type three von Neumann algebra. What, what matters about it is that there's no trace. So um, it's interesting that there's an expression for a relative, uh, for conditional entropy in terms of relative entropy, but in the expression, you exp we explicitly use tensor products and we explicitly use trace. But so um, yeah, see, so, so the, the identity there that I just carelessly put here that kills you, obviously, uh, this, yeah. this one. Um, um, yes. Um, so the but question is, can you avoid conditional entropies and just work with mutual information? So um, I think they're physically very different things. Uh, I think, so let me give you an example. So what we do is in quantum field theory, you know, like as high energy theorists, we usually regulate things and we work, we, we pretend the system is five dimensional, there's a cutoff. And then from, and then let's say we have a, there's a region that's associated, associated with B and A is like a region that's a little bit larger, right? So there's an inclusion of algebra, algebra of A sits inside the algebra of B. So we've known for a very long time now that in full generality, this conditional entropy might so conditional entropy could be thought of as a spatial derivative of von Neumann entropy, right? Roughly speaking. Now it's known for a very long time. It's been known for a very long time, like 10 years or so now by now, that if in, in the relativistic quantum field theory, if the region A is null, then this quantity is, the, is uh, finite. This quantity is like all the infinities cancel and it's independent of the regulator, but this is like sort of high energy physicist kind of arguments. We now sort of very strongly believe that's the case. The null derivative of 
uh, of von Neumann entropy should be well defined in quantum field theory. But nobody has actually ever managed to, prove, to define this quantity. It's, it's, it's an interesting setup that it still remains an open problem and we don't really know how to approach it. It is very relevant for quantum gravity, it's relevant for many different things. Um, so we, what in, in short, what we want is an expression that is similar to this, but somehow, yeah, it's, it's another way of regulating it perhaps. Yes. Um, hmm. So for instance, what I'm thinking is that, you know, maybe we can replace that identity you know, uh, on system A with an arbitrary state on A, and then we're taking a supremum or infimum, and then maybe that supremum or infimum would be well-defined, even though there's no identity. Um, there's no tracial thing, tracial thing defined, but and in some setups, there might be well-defined quantum fields here. We sort of maybe have to introduce a bunch of uh, limits and then, the, yeah. That's just a thought. I mean, we could discuss this another time. Um, yes, I mean, I guess the first thing you would want to do is right, just define H of A without even thinking about the B. Because uh, it seems to me that, that that's already where the difficulty lies. But that, that's just not going to be well defined. We know that that we're not going to be given that. That's just ill defined in quantum field. Okay. Okay. So, but but in your case, somehow the B contains enough uh, information about A so that the, the entropy is kind of Oddly. reduced yeah. and, and it becomes finite. Uh, yeah. So this is a subtraction of two entropies, right? And somehow this particular subtraction when the region A is null is well defined. Now we don't really know why. Um, we don't really have a good definition. So the region is null, I, I don't, maybe I don't understand. Oh, it means that, that uh, so in quantum field theory, we, we are dealing with uh, a system system that has symmetries that are not just, you know, it's a multi partite system. It's not just translations in time or space because the symmetry is like Lorentz symmetry group. So you can boost, you can mix space and time, right? And then we're talking about regions that could be on constant time, or they could be on some boosted surface. In particular, they could be on infinitely boosted regions, which are light-like. So it's just some setup that is very natural in quantum field theory. It's extreme. In that context, it's very natural. And it remains a confusing fact how to go okay, okay. finding this quantity in one, but and the issue is really one Neumann algebra issue. Uh, so I think there would be, there, there is some physics prize in a sense for defining this quantity or an intimately tied quantity to this in one Neumann algebra. Yes, yes. But obviously you, if you cannot define H of, of A, uh, then you can also not define H of A given B generally, right? Yes, but so, so, so to assume to something about the, the state. But these will uh, be fine. That's the point, right? So your B is, is finite? No. Uh, are, are you talking about the dimensionality of the Hilbert space? Yes, yes. They're all, they're all type three. <laughs> they're all type three, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt the talk, uh, especially because I think we've already kept you for too long. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, maybe maybe we could postpone this uh, to another time. And uh, yeah, feel free to uh, you know like come. Yeah, how sure. I, I guess I won't get to to the second part, but let me just maybe uh, mention one last thing that I find interesting. So okay, maybe the, not this. This is just showing that that entropy or conditional entropy is kind of quintessentially quantum because it can become negative. Um, but uh, what I just quickly want to mention is, so we have now tons of different ways in which we can define um, conditional entropies, Rennie entropies, right? They all suffer from the same problem, so they won't they won't solve your uh, your problem because we always have this identity in there. But we can either maximize over sigmas, or um, and we can take pets or or sandwiched. Um, now, there's one 
thing that I, I find really interesting and kind of wanted to advertise a little bit um, is this, we know very well this duality relation here. Um, the duality relation between, uh, for pure states, right? So entropy of A given B plus entropy of A given C has to add up to zero. Uh, one can think of this as, as an expression of monogamy of entanglement. Uh, so if A and B are entangled, then, then H of A given B is, is negative. And that means H of A given C uh, has to be positive so that there's no entanglement uh, in, in that uh, state. I mean, it's kind of a, a quantitative expression of this. Um, now it turns out that we can have duality relation just like that um, for, for these Rennie conditional entropies as well. Um, now, by the way, um, this relation might actually help you. depending on what your state is, because if you can find a C system that is small enough somehow, that you could define it as, as kind of minus H of A given C. Um, and that might be, that might be. There, there's one thing that confuses me about these duality relations. Uh, alpha plus beta is equal to two, not one. I mean, well, they're different, like they all have different conditions, right? So because they're, we, we had four different versions of defining and they, they have different relations. So, so the, this one is for the sandwich. But, uh, sandwich and, and maximize. Are, are so there it's actually one over alpha plus one over beta. This is kind of this Hölder type pairing. Yeah, that was a question. Is it a holder pairing? Yeah, okay. That is a holder pairing, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, with, 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 uh, there's a two instead of a one there, but but actually, if you just reparameterize, then they will be exactly the holder pairing. Um, thank you. Um, and then for the other one, it, it's it's different pairings. They they all kind of mirror at one, right? If you if you put one uh, for alpha and beta, then then it's satisfied. So so they they recover this this standard duality relation, um, but the, the the four of them are are, are very different. And the interesting thing for me mostly here is that they actually connect. So the third one here um, actually connects sandwich with pets. Um, and it's completely unclear to me why this happens. I, I just don't, I don't understand. Um, but I, I find it somewhat fascinating because these two families, um, um, at least I don't understand the relationship between them apart from why these conditional entropies. Um, 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 just to make sure this third relation also holds uh, for us less than half where and or also greater than two. Uh, there's a connection issue I, I didn't understand most of your questions sadly uh, oh sorry um for example this sandwich quantity is not defined for alpha less than half and pets is not defined for alpha greater than two but yes, uh, this conditional or this duality relation, the third one holds even when sandwich or pets are not defined. Is that correct? Um, yes, that's correct. But it also has the property, this alpha times beta equals one, that it actually maps the range where the sandwich is. Um, um, satisfy state processing to the range where the pets satisfy state processing, right? So one of them is between zero and two and the other one by one half uh, in infinity. So, so these ranges actually exactly get mapped into each other by this relation. 
So, sorry, uh, a question in terms of how we think about this. So sometimes people define max uh, conditional entropy as the min conditional entropy for the other, you know, like ABC for, for the other part for the complement. So this is considered to be a general, this is like a generalization of that to the alpha, to the Rennie family, right? Is that correct? Um, uh, sorry, I, I, maybe I, I didn't fully understand the first part of your... So when, when beta goes to infinity, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm misunderstanding, but when beta goes to infinity, we're dealing uh -huh. with, or when beta goes to half or, no, one, right? We're dealing with min and max conditional entropies, is that right? Oh, yeah, yeah, this general, so one special case here is the alpha is infinity and beta is one right. half. So sometimes this, people define this, max conditional entropy in terms of min conditional entropy. They define only one of them, and then they define this. The other one in terms of uh, the first one, max in terms of min, for example, with uh, this kind of pairing of A, B, C. So this is sort of like a generalization of that to a Rennie family. Is that correct? Exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah. I see. This might actually be a route to potentially, but this is, it sounds promising. We might have to look into this to see if we can define these sort of unknown algebras. Yeah, I mean, if the states that you're looking at, right, you, you're saying they're somehow special in the sense that they make this entropy disappear. And that might be because they have a, a somehow an efficient purification. Yeah, it, it would be very interesting to look into this. Yeah. Um, okay, good. Um, so, so let me um, wrap up. So, this the second part. I think it's getting too late here. So, so uh, I'll I'll have to skip it. Um, but um, it was just about how we actually um, use these in 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 um, hypothesis testing. Um, and okay, so it would have been quite a bit more. Um, I'm happy to to send you the slides. Um, if you're interested. That would be wonderful. That, that would be wonderful, absolutely. Um, also, well, okay, maybe, uh, yeah, whenever, uh, yeah. Um, yes, um, so, okay, so maybe as a, as a conclusion, um, um, we have in some sense, a, characterization uh, of quantum Rennie divergences, but it's very limited, right? So, so we have this minimal one, we have the maximum one. We know uh, this alpha C family, which all satisfy data processing, but actually we don't know, um, we, we don't have a characterization of, of all um, Rennie divergences that satisfy data processing. Now, there might be arbitrary uh, more such quantities. Um, um, another thing that I mentioned is this, this PETS uh, rain divergence. I don't really know what singles it out. Like why is that the one that appears in, in operational uh, solutions to operational problems? Um, um, so yeah, that, that's some, some kind of broad questions that, that I'm um, interested in. Another one is this uh, condition, conditional mutual information, which we don't have a good definition for the, for the Rennie um, version of that. Um, and this has to do with the fact that it, it's very difficult to, to define um, quantum Markov states and, and uh, classically there are many equivalent definitions and in quantum they, they are not equivalent anymore. So they're, they're, some um, difficulties that in there and that that's a kind of an open open problem. Um, yeah, so that's that's um, I guess all I wanted to say uh, today. Um, thank you so much, Marco. Let's uh, thank Marco for the wonderful talk. Tolerating uh, the ignorant high energy crowd. Um, are there questions for Marco? Uh, maybe I have a very naive question because you said that uh, you can usually think in terms of compression of real data and so on, but 
real data is usually not independent symbols. I think like here the assumption is that you have a series of independent symbols, right? Or uh, yes, yes. So so it's a discrete memoryless source. So so you get um, you you draw them from the same probability distribution. Yeah. But if you have a text or something, there is strong correlations between different symbols. So how that can one take that into account somehow? Um, yeah, well, I mean, then the the, the um, uh, uh, one can compress more, obviously, right? If one takes into account yes, yes, this. So. One can take this into account by by looking at instead of the entropy of every letter of the alphabet, right? You would also look at the conditional entropy of the next letter given uh, the letter you've just seen, and 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 then um, that conditional entropy would characterize how much space you need for the next letter and so on. And you so, can use the same definition somehow, or for the it is H and all that. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, one can still use these definitions. It's just that for practical problems, um, uh, as always, the, the maths uh, works better for ideal settings than, right? Because you, you not only need the next letter, you also need the one after and so So it's- Yes, yes. You essentially need some, some kind of limiting behavior of these conditional entropies. Um, and 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 then and then you, that that will determine what, uh, how much storage you minimally need. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any uh, last questions from Marco? We had a lot of questions, and we don't want to keep them for too long. Um, any other questions? If not, uh, let's thank him again. Well, yeah, and thanks again for, for in, inviting me. Um, I'm happy to, to discuss at